My first impression of Iraq in April of 2003 was when I was driving from Kuwait City to Baghdad in the first civilian convoy. It was about a 13 or 14 hour drive. We drove uh, north. This was a few days after Baghdad had fallen, after the statue had come down. We drove through the Shia heartland in the south. And what struck me then was for a country that had just been through a major war, how little collateral damage there was to the physical infrastructure of the country. It was, it was really quite uh, striking. This, the, 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 this, there was, was not a country that appeared to be broken or destroyed from war. That's not to say the physical infrastructure wasn't in terrible condition, but it was not, it was not bombed out. It was uh, a result of 35 years of chronic underinvestment in critical infrastructure, in the electrical infrastructure, in the oil production infrastructure, in the hospitals and schools. Uh, there were virtually no resources, complete misallocation of resources for over three decades dedicated to the physical uh, infrastructure of the country. And that was, that was striking to me and continues to be one of our major challenges, is how to, how to improve the overall physical infrastructure of this country as we try to get them on a path uh, towards uh, long-term independence here, economic independence. But even more powerful for me was not the state of the physical infrastructure. And, and it also is not something that you can uh, determine within your first couple weeks there. It takes some time, and it had the greatest impact on me, is the state of the psychological infrastructure of the Iraqi people. I don't think anybody here can appreciate the psychological state of a people that have been subjected to over three decades of one of the most brutal, uh, regardless of what you think of Iraq and whether or not we should have gone there or not, there's no debating uh, the, the uh, state of the Iraqi people after three, de three plus decades of one of the worst totalitarian regimes in, in modern history. The Human Rights Watch uh, estimates, based on their calculations, that the, what occurred in Iraq in terms of the human rights violations and the repression uh, are right up there, right after the genocide uh, inflicted by the Nazi regime, the Rwandan genocide, and Pol Pot in Cambodia. And so I think when assessing where Iraq is going, how we're going to move forward, we have to be realistic that these people are suffering emotionally, psychologically. They will be for a long time. There's enormous issues related to trust among one another and then the relationship they have with a government, whether let alone an occupation government, but even the <clears throat> Iraqi government that has taken over. Just to give you a couple of experiences I had that really drove that home, I remember after Saddam Hussein was captured, I was having dinner one night with Ambassador Bremer and a group of Iraqi political leaders. And sitting on either side of us were two Iraqi women, each were serving as members of the Iraqi Governing Council. And we were asking them, what, what's it like on the Iraqi street? What, what are the discussions around kitchen tables in Baghdad about the news about Saddam Hussein being captured? And one of the women told us, well, actually, the first thing I did when I heard the news is I called my brother in the Netherlands to tell him that Saddam had been captured. And I was sort of curious and asked her, well, why is your brother in the Netherlands? And she proceeded to explain that when her brother was in high school, one day in school, he was joking around with some friends and made a critical comment, a joke, about Saddam Hussein. And the next day, some of Saddam's security forces showed up, pulled him out of class, and pulled a group of students out of class to watch this as they held him and poured acid all over his face and body. And he's been in the Netherlands ever since, being treated uh, for this. She starts telling us a story and she starts to cry. Then the woman sitting to our left tells us that the first thing she did when she learned that Saddam had been captured is she gathered her children together to introduce them to their deceased uncle. Again, this I was struck by this and we, we asked some more questions and she told us that her brother when they were younger, was involved in organizing some political activity against Saddam Hussein, and one day he disappeared and was killed. And the family was so terrified of saying a word about this, drawing any attention to themselves, lest the same fate should fall upon them. 
So they just minded their own business, never said a word, and they were so terrified that even when she grew older, got married, started a family, and had children of her own, never told her children that they had an uncle. It was as though he did not exist. And so she said the first thing she did when she heard about Saddam's capture, feeling that there was really a closing, the curtain had finally closed on these 35 awful years, she sat her children down and told them all about their uncle. And she starts to cry. And she's telling, so here I am sitting with these two women who are both crying, telling these highly emotional stories. And that to me is typical of my experience in Iraq. You cannot find, I at least, and I've interacted with hundreds if not thousands of Iraqis over my 15 months there, I have not met one single Iraqi whose immediate family was not directly affected by Saddam's regime. A brother who went missing, a father who'd been killed, a son who's in a mass grave, a wife who'd been put in a rape room and tortured. Uh, this, this goes on everywhere. It completely permeates every part of the society, including the elite Sunni areas most loyal to Saddam Hussein. 